Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Omar Dahi. I teach economics here at Hampshire College. And uh, I'm very happy to be presenting this great event that we have today, two panel events on the Middle East. I'm going to say a few words of introduction, uh, introduce our speakers, and I'll make it very quick so we can get on with, with, uh, with the main event. A recent report by the Syrian Center for Policy Research just published uh, a couple weeks ago, has estimated that the total number of people killed in the Syrian conflict, directly or indirectly, since 2011 is about 470,000. This number is far higher than the total figure of 250,000 that was used by the UN for a very long time until it simply gave up on collecting statistics of casualties about 18 months ago. In all, the report says around 11.5% of the country's population has been killed or injured. The number of wounded is estimated as 1.9 million. Life expectancy in Syria has dropped from 70 years in 2010 to 55.4 in 2015. And overall economic losses are estimated at around $255 billion. Despite these horrifying statistics, one of the things that continues to puzzle and boggle the minds of many people in the region when I travel there is how forgotten the crisis has become, at least in mainstream media coverage in Europe and the US, particularly in the US. What's worse is that when the crisis is remembered, it's looked at through the lens of the possibility of spillover to the West in the form of the so-called refugee menace or the potential for extremism or terrorist acts. But the way that the conflict is experienced and understood by the people themselves is totally absent, as well as the possibilities for solutions. Today we seek to remedy that by focusing on how the region itself and the people of the region are coming to terms with, with what is taking place. Uh, we're honored to have a great lineup of speakers who are experts on the topic, who have conducted extensive research in the region or about the region. And who are going to shed, shed light on the different aspects of the crisis from their perspectives. There are many common threads that unite the speakers, but one of them is unfortunately discussions about violence. Both the motivations behind the violence, the different levels of violence that are taking place, the various destructive consequences, but also more broadly, living in the shadow of constant violence and anticipating it, that too has an impact on people's daily lives. And hopefully, discussing the possibilities for ending the violence or socioeconomic recovery and peaceful settlement of the crisis. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to say a few word of thanks to all the people who made the event today possible. I'd like to start off by thanking Carol Boudreau and Eleni Magnus, who really put everything together, and I'd please give them a hand. Um, I'd like to also thank President uh, Jonathan Lash and the Dean of Faculty and Acting President Eva Rushman. Uh, not just for their generous support, but actually President Lash uh, last year actually took the initiative and leadership uh, along with the other five college presidents in pushing for more programming on Syria. And he approached me and uh, asked, you know, why don't we have more involvement, more programming? And uh, this is part of that response. And over the coming months and a couple of years, you'll see more events that are being put together by other uh, faculty members across the five colleges, including Professor Stephen Heidemann, who just put an excellent event a couple of weeks ago at Smith College on torture taking place in Syrian prisons in Syria. Um, and there'll be more events, so please look for those. In addition to the Dean of Faculty and President's Office, uh, I'd like to thank the Peace and World Security Studies Program, the Third World Studies Program, uh, the School of Critical Social Inquiry, as well as the Refugees and Migrants Project from the Arab Studies Institute. And with that, I'll introduce our speakers for the first panel. 
in the order that they're going to speak. I'll introduce all our speakers and then uh, they'll take it from there. Our first speaker is Professor Samir Abboud. Samir is an Associate Professor of International Studies at Arcadia University, where he currently holds the Frank and Evelyn Steinbrucker Endowed Chair. He has published on topics related to Syria and the wider Middle East in journals such as the Arab Studies Quarterly, New Political Science, and Security Dialogue. Uh, Samir has just published an excellent book on Syria uh, from Polity Press. If you really want to get a concise, nuanced, very informed take on the Syrian conflict, its causes, its trajectories, please buy Samir's book. It's really wonderful. Uh, after that, our next speaker is uh, Kathy Hayek. She's a PhD candidate in communications at UMass Amherst. Kathy holds a master's degree in communication and development studies from Ohio University and a graduate certificate in women's gender and sexuality studies. Her research interests broadly center around themes of gender, conflict, activism, and the challenges that Syrian refugee women confront in Jordan. And one of her really interesting articles uh, that she published uh, last year is called Double Marginalization, Mainstream Online Activism, and the Invisibility of Syrian Refugee Women's Perspectives in the Global Media. A uh, very interesting uh, study about activism surrounding refugees. Our next speaker will be Mr. Olivia Lavinal, who is the Special Assistant of the Vice President for the Middle East and North Africa region at the World Bank since 1913. Prior to joining the bank, Olivia was the Chief of Staff of the Mayor of Lyon, after being the head of the mayor's office at the French Senate. Uh, Olivia specializes in IR and economics with a focus on the Middle East region and holds a master's degree from Sciences Po in Paris. He's also a member of the team that has just revised the strategy of the World Bank Group in the MENA region and is currently working on launching the MENA financing facility. And he's been traveling throughout the region conducting analysis uh, on uh, socioeconomic recovery and the ma aftermath of the uprisings, uh, both in countries that witnessed uh, social movements and, and, other, and mass mobilization and others that didn't. Our last speaker on the first panel will be Professor Vijay Prof Prashad, professor, professor of International Studies at Trinity College, and a journalist for Frontline, The Hindu, The Pan-Arab, Al-Arabi Jadid, and other journals. His focus is on Middle Eastern politics, development, economics, and North-South relations. And he's published widely many, many books on the Middle East and other topics, uh, many of which my students have read in my classes. Uh, he's actually finishing up a manuscript right now about the Arab uprisings, which is uh, incredibly interesting. It's going to be titled The Death of a Nation and the Future of the Arab Revolution. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you, Omar. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, thank you to the organizers. My apology to the organizers for being so uh, slow in responding to emails. So this is my public apology. Um, when, I was a, when I was a graduate student and when I started my career, I noticed that academics often give disclaimers before they give their presentations, and I always thought it was funny. Uh, so my disclaimer, which is a legitimate one, is that I've been suffering from an ear infection. So if I start screaming into the microphone, <laughs> please just tell me to calm down, because I, my hearing kind of comes and goes. Uh, I promise that's the only funny thing I'm going to say today. Uh, so, uh, I promise I'm starting. Uh, you know, at this point, it's, it's rather cliché to say that the Syrian conflict is complicated, that it's multi-layered, uh, things of that nature, that it has multiple regional driver, drivers, multiple international drivers. At this point, everybody in this room should know this, the lay observer uh, should even know this. So for me, um, what this does is it raises the analytical challenge of highlighting the different layers of the conflict. So if we accept that it is a multi-layered conflict, how can we um, highlight some of these layers and discuss them and to see their interplay uh, domestically, regionally, uh, etc. If we were meeting six months ago, I would suggest that the central question we should all ask ourselves is why is there a political and military stalemate in Syria? Um, and I felt, I, I feel um, as though engagement with this question 
helps us to think about the nuances and interrelationships uh, that make up the complexity of the Syrian conflict. However, it's not six months ago, it's today, and we're meeting in the context of the Russian intervention, which has dramatically altered the dynamics of the conflict, uh, and, and in doing so, dramatically altered the conditions that gave rise to the military and political stalemate. In doing so, it is, it is likely propelling the Syrian conflict um, uh, down a very different trajectory. So I, I want to begin today, and I'm actually going to spend most of the time actually kind of answering this first question about how a stalemate emerges, or answering parts of it. And I'm going to do so with reference to what I call networks of violence. And I hope that this gives you a sense of how I understand the conflict landscape in Syria. Uh, so this helps me um, think about how violence has proliferated, why violence looks the way that it does, and what this means for the conflict overall. What I'm not going to do, and I think would be impossible and kind of pointless, is tell you kind of who's fighting who. That's not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is looking at uh, uh, what gives rise to the proliferation of violence. Uh, from there, I'm going to talk a bit about the Russian intervention, how it disrupts the stalemate, um, and what it means for any possible political solution uh, to the Syrian conflict. So I have this kind of you know, interest in um, trying to understand the organizational structure of violence in Syria. And I found that the framework of networks, this idea of, of, of networks, has been very useful. And so for me, in, in my research, I've kind of highlighted uh, three basic structures that serve as the nodes of the violent networks. Um, and these, to me, are what um, give the conflict landscape its dominant feature, which is that it's non-hierarchical and that it's fragmented. What do I mean by that is that the um, different groups fighting in Syria, they're not vertically coordinated uh, or, uh, uh, sorry, horizontally coordinated, I'll blame that on the ear, uh, or vertically coordinated. So this is, uh, this is what the violence kinds of, kind of looks like. It hasn't uh, coalesced. Uh, so the first node is uh, what I think we would best refer to as a battalion or a company. And these are made up of, of uh, small numbers of fighters, not necessarily any leaders, uh, geographically concentrated in specific areas. Their characteristics are that they have limited resources, small numbers, and they're geographically concentrated. And this uh, happens throughout Syria, not just on what we might call regime uh, areas or uh, rebel areas. Brigades are the second node in the network. And these are uh, conglomerations of battalions that are under the command of a centralized leadership. And because of this structure, brigades have a much wider geographic range. So they're not kind of confined to neighborhoods or areas, but um, maybe entire cities, maybe uh, uh, provinces. Okay? So they're distinguished from battalions because they consist of dozens, maybe even hundreds of fighters, and have wider geographic reach with some sort of command structure. Uh, the larger um, form of coordination is the front. Maybe many of you have heard of, of these things. They uh, kind of pop up and, and collapse uh, very quickly. Uh, so the fronts are the third node in the network of violence, and these are conglomerations of the brigades. Uh, and these serve more as, uh, I would define them as military alliances, rather than attempts to establish hier hierarchy uh, in military command. And these usually form in the context of battlefield necessity. Uh, they're, they're composed of dozens of brigades, um, typically one, two, three, four, or five very strong ones, and then dozens of uh, smaller ones. And because of the large number of brigades, loyalty is often very weak, uh, and brigades kind of come in and out uh, of these structures. So I, what I would say, th this is the kind of organizational structure, um, and I mentioned earlier that uh, fragmentation and um, kind of decentralization defines them. The third kind of definition or characteristic of them uh, is their fluidity. So these fronts form and they collapse, and a different front forms and a different one collapse. Um, this is what uh, the political scientist Paul Stanland calls um, uh, kind of fragmented armed groups. And he, he refers to these kinds of networks of violence as fragmented, uh, in part because they have weak social and political entrenchment in the conflict landscape. 
so if we think of uh, groups that have maybe strong entrenchment, uh, the best example I can think of is maybe Hezbollah, Hamas, that sort of stuff. That might be a, a contrast for, for people to think about. Uh, in the Syrian case, with the possible, uh, arguable exception of the PYD, the, the main kind of Kurdish party, uh, very few of the armed groups, uh, even the FSA brigades that started uh, forming at the beginning of the conflict, have a kind of strong level of social and political entrenchment. Uh, and this entrenchment is actually really important to understanding the conflict. And unfortunately, I don't have time to talk too much about it, but I will summarize what I think are the main factors that have caused this. Uh, first, uh, the kind of lack of political parties and associations from which to mobilize the population. Uh, Professor Stephen Hademan is in here, wrote an excellent article, I believe in 2013, <clears throat> that asked the question how in the absence, I'm uh, sorry if I'm misinterpreting, but how in the absence of associations and political parties were uh, Syrians able to mobilize? And the answer was that they relied on social networks. So there, there weren't associations and institutions from which to mobilize, and I think this has a kind of long-term effect uh, that we're seeing now. Uh, a second factor is the atomization of individual subjectivity and the absence of collective mobilization opportunities. Uh, the third, which for me is very important, uh, the material drivers of the conflict. Um, and uh, finally, uh, kind of different social bases um, that have, have changed over time. So different allegiances, whether let's say in Raqqa and Deir Azur, where uh, different tribal authorities have pledged allegiance uh, to uh, rebel groups, the regime or whatever, th things of that nature. So basically there's this kind of uh, constant change on the ground um, that's preventing <coughs> many of these groups from uh, entrenching themselves within, within Syria. And so what this does, because the groups aren't able to, uh, to really entrench themselves, it forces them into these cooperative networks that basically enhance their geographic reach. They uh, contribute to resource distribution, uh, goods, food, weapons, things of that nature. Uh, and in doing so, it ensures their survival. So in short, what I would like to suggest is that these groups enter into these cooperative agreements not for ideological reasons, which I think a lot of uh, popular uh, uh, narratives want to suggest, but they do so for material reasons, for political reasons, uh, for military reasons, and not just ideological ones. So cooperation, the formation of these fronts, the kind of fluidity of these groups is often out of necessity <coughs> broadly defined. So for me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying a very complicated process here. The, the, but I want to say that the military and political stalemate emerges because these networks form in ways that allow, that, are, that allow them to be strong enough to continue fighting, but not weak enough to overrun each other or um, the regime forces. So everyone is kind of strong enough to continue fighting, not strong enough to win, if we want to use that, that language. Um, regional rivalry, rivalries further ensured that resources were directed to different networks to help maintain the stalemate, and such balances on the battlefield were reflected and mirrored in the political arena, where major actors inside and outside of Syria uh, remained committed to a military solution rather than a political one. So politics uh, was not made possible because of the, the way that many um, many of the main kind of actors had, had committed to a military solution. So the, the military stalemate, perhaps counterintuitively, never made political concessions attractive. So again, I'm simplifying a very complex process, but I'll leave it at that. So uh, what's the picture I'm painting here? There's a fluid and unstable, yet proliferating organizational structure of violence that produces this stalemate. Uh, basically, especially from kind of 2013 uh, to 2015. And I want to stress again here how fragmented this organizational structure really is, really is um, and how it's a, it's a feature of the, of the armed groups. It's actually, for me, one of the defining um, features. And it's the immediate context in which the Russian intervention is occurring. Right? So the, the Russian intervention is occurring in a context where these groups 
are, are not only fighting the regime, but they're fighting each other. The alliances are constantly shifting, and there isn't a kind of monopolization of power or violence uh, within, uh, within Syria. And I would say sort of parenthetically that we see similar patterns happening on the uh, uh, regime side as well, with the proliferation of, of, of uh, uh, regime-aligned militias, regional militias coming in to support the regime. So there really is this proliferation and fragmentation of violence. One of the central questions facing any armed group in conflict, and certainly in the Syrian case, is the ability to socially, militarily, and economically reproduce themselves. They need to get recruits, they need to find weapons, they need to make money, and they need to do so to finance their military and their administrative um, needs. What I would like to suggest is that the Russian intervention is squeezing at the ability of the, of the armed groups to reproduce because they're altering the material and geographic conditions under which the networks formed. The indiscriminate bombing of civilian areas, not to mention the suffocation of supply routes, first in the south, uh, very quickly after the Russian intervention came in, they blocked off the, um, the areas around Dara, and then now if you look at the geography of the conflict, they're really concentrating on blocking off the northern supply routes. And, and what this does is that it, severely, it negatively affects the, the ability of the armed groups to reproduce themselves. So it is reduced, the intervention has reduced and degraded the capacity of the armed groups to the point which their conditions for reproduction are severely disrupted. And so what this means is that the, the reasons behind network formation are, are really being changed uh, in the Syrian context. And it's very early right now to, to say what that means. I don't think that it will mean the complete suffocation or destruction of the groups. I think that they'll find ways to adapt. But they're certainly under tremendous pressure. So the disruption of the stalemate has resulted in an, in an agreement on the ceasefire, which took place recently. I'm sure many of you have seen this. Uh, paradoxically, what this has suggested to many is that the Russian intervention has made politics possible. Whereas the stalemate made politics impossible, people are suggesting now that politics is again possible. But there's a particular kind of politics that is prefigured by Russia's intervention. And it's not necessarily a kind of politics in which violence and conflict are disincentivized, or one in which any meaningful political demands, such as a serious substantive political transition, may materialize. That's the cynic in me. Mm. Uh, to conclude, um, when, the, when the larger history of the Syrian conflict is told, we will need to take seriously, or take into serious consideration how to disaggregate the conflict into various stages and periods. The transitions from the period of a stalemate to the post-Russian intervention period will, in my opinion, be one of the dominant structuring narratives of this disaggregated history, and will help us answer questions about the trajectory of the conflict. It will also help give us insight into the different forms of authority that are included or excluded from political arrangements. And I fear uh, uh, the continuity of different, although no less disturbing, forms of violence in Syria. Thank you.
my passion for lived experience and uh, telling stories about the refugee crisis uh, started. So, what I should do? So maybe you are in the audience are experts in the refugee crisis like Dr. Stephen Heidman, or maybe you were interested to learn more. So I will start telling you the whole story from the beginning. Uh, so if you are expert or no expert, you will like share it from my perspective as how I see the crisis. So obviously, Syrian crisis in comparison with a lot of humanitarian crisis currently is one of the biggest. Uh, humanitarian crisis since uh, World War Two, with uh, over two million Syrian out of like around the 20, 22 million uh, Syrians are affected uh, badly by the crisis. Of course, if you are, I don't know, over 20, you know, you you were. Um, you know a lot about the Arab uh, Spring uprisings and how. Uh, the Syrian uh, uprising started in 2011 and here like not all Syrians supported the Syrian uprising or were like in resistant uh, mood but a lot of people around the country like this demonstration in Hama uh, wanted uh, political uh, and social change in the country but because of international and regional uh, intervention and support for different uh, groups we like we are now uh, in this awful uh, civil war so this map like show little bit of the complexity of the situation right now in the conflict the gray uh, color is where isis is controlling the red color where the syrian government is controlling the green is represent different uh, groups of the Syrian armed opposition and the yellow in, in the north is where the Kurds uh, uh, groups, uh, the armed Kurds, Kurd, Kurd groups uh, control. Uh, one of the biggest motivation why people fleeing the country of course is the infrastructure, uh, hospitals, residence area uh, is destroyed and this like comparison between the, before the war and after the war <coughs> and electricity uh, which is affected badly in the spaces where ISIS and the opposition is controlling more than the Syrian regime and this image shows, uh, shows that so the Syrian uprising mainly started in in the north central the country and the north but like if you see uh, in the south, the Ra'a, where a lot of uh, Syrian refugees came, so you will see like how the infrastructure, like electricity, is almost uh, gone currently. So important thing to me because people in the U.S. always started like to be attached to the Syrian refugee crisis recently after the flu of the Syrian refugee from the Middle East to Europe, right? But most Syrian refugees are in the region, in Syria and neighboring country. Uh, out of like the over 12 million Syrians who are affected badly by the conflict, uh, more than, like around 8 million are internally displaced people inside Syria. Uh, and then most of the other are in neighboring country, in very poor neighboring country like Lebanon, very small country with very limited infrastructure, Jordan, uh, Turkey is better, Iraq is in crisis. So only 10% of this whole refugee um, people went to Europe. And also like when the West get attached especially like with iconic images like this image to the Syrian refugee crisis, there is also like the negative and more complicated Islamophobia and racism and media representation that is 
not nice at all about the complex. So this controversial uh, photo was drawn by Charlie Hebdo, a French magazine recently, marking the death of Alain Kurdi and uh, predicting that if he was alive, he will grow up and be sexual attacker in Germany. Um, also, this I did not find updated information. So Canada, this data did not, did, does not apply to Canada, but uh, state that since the most armed to Syria have accepted the, few, the fewest refugees. And the United States is the great example about this situation. They sent to Syria over seven billion uh, dollars for arms, but they accepted less than 1,500 refugee uh, person. Uh, so if I want to focus more in uh, Syria neighboring country and how the refugee crisis is today there, uh, my <coughs> research uh, is more focused on in Jordan. So I want to go to these images that uh, that the refugee camp, for example, or the traditional and more stereotype image in our head about uh, refugee camps and refugee crisis is reduced to these images. Even though like I went and I worked for a little bit in, in that refugee, uh, that refugee camp, but most Syrian refugees, for example, in Jordan do not live in traditional camps. They live uh, in urban uh, areas. And what the challenge is that that face. So if you were a Syrian refugee, especially from poor class, because poor Syrians or people from working <coughs> class are the, the most uh, negatively affected in this crisis. And you crossed uh, the border uh, to the Zaatari refugee camps. You are faced by like living in very poor conditions, right? Uh, so you are either, you will live either in a tent, which in the winter will be like destroyed, or you will live in like more very small uh, mobile house, which is also dangerous because I met like women and inside the refugee camps there was a uh, mafia. Like someone will like talk with the UN or with, with other international organizations and become the gatekeeper. And he will say, I'm insider, I'm Syrian, I will distribute, distribute these resources to other Syrian refugee people, but especially a lot of refugees are single mothers, not because they wanted to be single mothers, but because their relative uh, husbands and uh, male uh, either died in the conflicts, conflict or they are fighters. So you are in a uh, situation that the power relation is very, uh, puts you in very like disadvantaged position and a lot of women did not have access to this type of uh, of uh, resources, so they did not, they weren't able to sleep at night because they were like scared, uh, like how you can sleep at night and you you never know, you don't have a door uh, at your home, so anyone can like simply enter. So, uh, so in Jordan, uh, most people, when uh, like around fifty percent of the people who became refugees there are from southern Syria, from Dara'a. Uh, and they, most of them will live in the north, northern part of Jordan. So that, uh, the Syrian map uh, to the right, where, from where uh, refugees in Jordan came from Syria, and the one to the left is a Jordan map. So. Um, my, Second example is uh, Lebanon. In Lebanon, there is no formal camp, so you have like now around maybe two million Syrian refugees in, in Lebanon, and they just like rent houses and live in very poor uh, housing conditions. And not be, so a lot of people are not formally registered within the UN, which also like, uh, put a lot of uh, documentation obstacles if you want to have food aid or any type of aid. Even people in the example in Jordan who like escape from the Atari camp because they, they don't live, uh, want to live in traditional uh, refugee camp setting, 
they will like lose their uh, uh, papers uh, and they will not be able to continue in touch with uh, uh, the UN to like get access to food. And actually, like the humanitarian aid are cut so badly. So that's like my next challenge that I want to share. That even UNSCR last year in 2015, uh, they were able to. Uh, <coughs> To, to, to have access to only of 60% of the budget that they proposed that they will need to help Syrian refugees. So in my research, so also like when we think about Syrian refugees, we only think about Syrian refugees who are poor and in need of help. But why I started my PowerPoint with the, Sir the Arab Spring and the Syrian uprising? Because <coughs> Uh, the, like, the expertise that activists developed at that early stage uh, of uh, the uprising did not go and it's still in use. A lot of... Uh, so when international organizations did not have the enough uh, funds and resources to help Syrian refugees, the, the groups that really doing a great job in reaching to the most marginalized groups and the people who like who did not have paper or access to regular humanitarian aid are formed by Syrian activists uh, who are, a lot of them uh, in early 20s, uh, they became involved in activism through the Syrian uprising and developed the uh, skills uh, in that regard. So when I was in Jordan, I worked with Mulham volunteering team. They are they were college students who started activist group to help Syrian refugees in Jordan. But now they develop their uh, reach and they even like develop uh, a lot of uh, humanitarian aid campaigns inside Syria and in Lebanon and in Turkey. Uh, and they they de depend in their funding uh, on uh, a lot uh, on social networking websites like Facebook. Uh, and most of their funders are Palestinian and other refugees uh, in their like other generation of a previous refugees <laughs> in the region who like feel real solidarity with the Syrian refugee crisis because they know what the, what being a refugee means and they went in this experience decades ago. This another example like different organization uh, even like for more conservative. Uh, <coughs> Uh, type of ideology. Uh, I don't, I think, have time to say that. I have? So, uh, this organization, so Syrian Women Association, so there is a challenge, like there is hopes, in my opinion, that activists are able, if they were from privileged education or a class ba background, to help Syrian refugees by, like, Syrian, helping Syrian, right? But also there is restrictions. So in Jordan, you cannot register a lot of the organization. In Lebanon, it's the same uh, situation. Uh, but people like find way to work type of illegally. Uh, so this organization uh, was based on, uh, was formed by uh, more like Islamic feminists who came to Jordan from the um, like little uprisings that we had in the 80s uh, in the country. Uh, and they like try to help a lot uh, the most marginalized women who uh, who are from very conservative families and do not have like skills to like deal in public spaces. Uh, so they tr try to train them and uh, help them with cash uh, aids. Also, there is, for example. Uh, this organization, uh, Jordanian Women's Union, who was formed like 60 years ago by uh, a Palestinian refugee women, and then Jordanian women joined them, and they also like work in very uh, underprivileged uh, neighborhood in Jordan. Uh, the last comment, comment that I want to conclude with is uh, what I think is also one of the most challenges that Syrian refugee face, and it's uh, a factor that drives their uh, uh, immigration to uh, Europe uh, is education. 
most a lot of schools in Syria were destroyed, and when families are uh, becoming refugees in neighboring country, they do not ha their children are not having access to proper education. I did interview recently. Uh, with a journalist who was for the last three years uh, doing investigations about education uh, in Lebanon and other uh, and Syria and other neighboring country, and he said, based on his research in Lebanon, that if we have six hundred uh, million, sorry, six hundred thousand uh, Syrian refugee children. Only around 100,000 of them are getting proper education. The other half a million uh, refugee children, they rarely have uh, access to education. And when they have, uh, it's like just basic training for like to learn how to write uh, and read. So uh, Syrian for the last like decades were so ambitious in education for a lot of reasons. And a lot of people who immigrated to Germany, <coughs> Germany, including my brother, one of their reasons that, for example, my brother said, okay, I have a child and I want to, uh, for him to have a good education. And if I stayed in the region, that will never happen. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask me later. Thank you. so much for the invitation but um, I have uh, and I do work at the World Bank but I haven't started working at the World Bank in 1913 it was in 2013 I do seem old to, uh, to some of you I'm not that old so Omar if you, uh, if you would be so kind it was a long time ago it feels some days but uh, I'll tell you why um, so hello again, my name is Olivier Lavinal. I work at the World Bank for the Vice President of the World Bank in charge of the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa region, which covers uh, 20 countries from Morocco to Iran. So we have on the one hand the Middle East and its um, current issues. Um, some of my colleagues say, including the President, by the way, of the World Bank, that uh, the Syrian conflict is the issue of our time. And I think it summarizes well what we are up against. Climate change is one of the big issues of our time. The Syrian conflict and its impact on the neighboring countries is also one. But it also takes into account the Maghreb regions, i.e. the North Africa countries, such countries like Tunisia or Morocco, uh, which are in a very different state, but as you know, which have themselves um, uh, gone through a series of revolutions. The Arab Spring started in Tunisia, and uh, I, was there, I was there just a, a few days ago. Maybe to kick off this presentation, I can start with uh, you know what uh, one of the CEO of a very famous NGO said in Tunisia uh, to me uh, a few days ago. He um, was basically telling me all about the drivers of vulnerability in Tunisia. We were trying to understand what are the economic, social, and institutional causes of instability in Tunisia and the rest of the region. That speaks to probably a new role for the World Bank, one you know that works more with NGOs, more with academics, and tries to figure out how it can act on the causes of instability upstream. <coughs> and then at the end of our conversation, he, 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 you know, he, uh, the delegation left, and he asked me to stay for a second, and he said, listen, um, this is all great and uh, I love Tunisia, but at the end of the day I would like to study in the United States and I was wondering if you did any student loans at the World Bank. Mm. <laughs> so unfortunately it could be useful, but the, the answer to, uh, to Karim uh, was no, we don't do any student loans, but we, should, we certainly hope to be able to discuss with you and with him uh, uh, a bit more to understand uh, what we are up against. Um, what I want to tell you today is um, the journey the voyage of um, these last few months, which um, was uh, or led 
to a revised regional strategy at the World Bank and um, also thereafter how we intend or hope to take that strategy and implement it uh, in the region. So very quickly there are three main ideas I would say. Uh, one um, is uh, to uh, acknowledge the new realities on the ground and how conflict in Syria and elsewhere or instability more generally speaking in the entire region has an impact on the role that you know the different organizations should play and we have to acknowledge that. Um, the second point is that this fragility <coughs> comes on top of, you've read the press, you know, declining oil prices and that have an impact of course on the general um, economics and of, of the region but also of long-standing uh, structural weaknesses or structural challenges. Let me just give you one example. Mm, uh, female labor participation in the MENA region is the lowest. 21% of women in the MENA region only uh, work. Tells you a lot about you know, what the MENA region is up, up against. So the conflict and instability, but also these challenges uh, oblige us to think differently how we do business in, in the region and you know, oblige us to think how we can, we can, we can help the region. Um, and the third point is really um, how we change our strategy over the last few um, months to actually come up with the, the idea which is you know, the title of this presentation is how economic and social inclusion can or should promote peace and stability in the region. So let me start um, by the realities on the ground, the new realities on the ground. Everyone of, know, of you, of course, know that um, the MENA region in itself, um, be it Syria, of course, and the impact the conflict has on the neighboring countries, or other countries such as Yemen, such as Libya, such as many others, unfortunately, uh, is in turmoil. The question is, for an organization like the World Bank, and the topic of my presentation will not be the World Bank, but just so you know where I'm coming from, um, is why do we want to promote peace and stability specifically in this region, and why are we trying to um, collectively answer this, uh, this, 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 this major issue, and by the way, not doing such a great job um, at this stage. Well, first and foremost, because peace and stability in the MENA region is a global public good. There's no way around it, i.e. it is because a conflict in MENA has, um, or conflicts in MENA have global spillover effects um, that we need to really focus, uh, it's another reason why we need to really focus on, on, on trying to find a solution. Um, promoting peace and stability is also a prerequisite for inclusive growth and that will be the second um, idea that I will be developing here. What we've noted over the past few decades in the MENA region and in other regions but specifically in the MENA region and probably one of the causes of the Arab Spring was that the growth was not shared. Uh, there was growth um, 5 to 7 percent in some countries like Egypt and Tunisia per year over the last 10 years prior to the uh, Arab Spring 20. 10, 2011 uh, uprisings. But was that growth shared? And the answer to that question is, of course, no. So, social justice comes in as, um, as, as, as one, of the, one of the causes. Among the risks in MENA, um, conflict and violence, we've talked a lot about it, and um, it's going to be the, uh, the, our, our, our um, subject today. Uh, refugees and displace, displacement is also the Syrian story. Sluggish glo glo <coughs> global growth is important to bear in mind. Climate vulnerability, we'll not talk about today, but in a region like MENA where drought is the biggest issue, it has a consequence. Natural disasters have a consequence and um, sometimes uh, walk hand in hand with human disasters. Unfinished structural challenges, I mentioned it briefly, and the oil prices, of course, not only impact the region, the oil importing and the oil exporting countries, but way beyond, of course, the MENA region. So, when thinking about the new strategy, we asked ourselves, okay, what is the objective of you know, development or of organizations such as the World Bank? Bear in mind that the World Bank was created uh, at Bretton Woods in 1944, one year before the end of the Second World War. 
So um, we're very much in that spirit, or we should very much be in that spirit of you know, planning for peace, let's call it this way, and trying to you know, lay the ground for um, reconstruction. Um, so our efforts are about fostering a greater peace and stability, not only because it's important for the MENA region, but because it's important for the world. Here you have the various photos of a very bloody year in 2015. Unfortunately, um, the Syria conflict um, seems nowhere close to ending, um, so we are up for um, a, a few uh, other terrible months. The um, refugees' issues um, create uh, tension, including in other regions, such as Europe, as you are very well aware, and, and thus oblige us to think of this not as a regional issue, not as a national issue, but clearly as a global issue. And you have this nexus of negative cross-regional spillovers that you can see on the right-hand corner, which is all about, you know, uh, the impact that it has. Um, I will go very quickly to uh, confirm that our estimates are in line with what has been said so far. $200 billion is the cost of the Syrian conflict. Um, but beyond, you know, the economic cost, there is obviously a huge human and social cost to Syria. But beyond Syria, to the neighboring countries. You know, um, we all uh, should know that, you know, what um, Lebanon and Jordan have taken on in terms of, of, of size of refugees is basically just like the, if the entire Mexico was to move to the United States. That's the <coughs> magnitude that we're talking about, right? Um, so, um, or like a country like, you know, I mean, it's the equivalent of an entire country like uh, African, middle-sized African country like Cameroon. So. We're talking, I mean, major, um, uh, major shifts. And in economic terms, the mandate of the World Bank, that means $5.6 billion, uh, the cost of the economy per year in Lebanon, and it means a bit less in other countries, but it's in the billions, okay? So when we are up against um, trying to rethink or think the reconstruction, what is, um, to a certain extent, overwhelming is, is the magnitude. Uh, but it also calls for um, um, uh, the you know, need for the international community as a whole to, uh, to come together. Um, I won't be too long on the oil prices because this should not turn into an economic uh, class. Um, but just so you, so you know, I mean, um, I don't know if it's a true or a, or a, or a wrong st or a false story, but it seems that um, um, it seems that uh, in Chinese, the word for crisis has two signs, right? One sign that, um, maybe it is a wrong story that you react, and one sign that actually refers to crisis, and one sign that refers to opportunity. I think that the original story is JFK one day used that, and ever since, everyone, you know, uses it again. Let's say it's, let's say it's not true, but we don't really care. Let's say that it's actually um, relevant to our, to, to our presentation here. The crisis we all know, uh, the break-even point, that means the point where, you know, uh, uh, fiscal balance needs to be attained is above the, the current uh, oil price in these countries, which means that these countries are up against, um, you know, major fiscal difficulties. Um, now, the opportunity it comes with is, um, um, is that, you know, it frees space uh, for reforms and as the World Bank group, I have to say, we encourage, you know, um, reforms in fuel subsidies. And so uh, that answers that point, uh, of course, but uh, more, more, more should, be, should be said. I only have a few more minutes, so let me just um, tell you that um, the one reflection that we had when looking at all this um, is, um, okay, so there's something that we haven't seen at the World Bank over the last few years, or that we are not advocating. Let's 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 um, let's look back at the past and understand what created, what caused the Arab Spring. And it's not the the GDP growth rate, because as you can see, it was quite high over the last decades in every important country of the MENA region. Um, it's probably <coughs> dissatisfaction and unhappiness. This is a survey, uh, the World Value Survey, that shows that you know in MENA dissatisfaction was very high compared to other countries of the world. Now, one may ask why? Well, in Tunisia, for example, the reason for that um, was um, the weak economy. Contrary to uh, what a lot of people actually wrote, uh, politics played a role. Dignity is, of course, you know, essential uh, to it. 
But what the end of the day, what you know, really, um, um, or was one of the main reasons um, for for the revolutions, what triggered it, was um, you know sharing the the fruits of growth and the fact or the lack of. Um, this is a great um, this is a great graph because it shows the extent of the issues of the MENA region. Um, basically, youth unemployment is a major problem, as you all know, in the region. But what you will see here in that graph is, unfortunately, the unemployment rises with the level of education. <coughs> Meaning, the more educated you are in the MENA region, the less chance you have to actually have a job. Okay, so that takes not only. Uh, that's, that's actually not only huge economically, because it speaks to the quality of education and to the mismatch between education and, and the job market, but it actually takes away that hope and, and, and sense of you know, future. And that's going to be one of the issues to address, quality of education and, and, and jobs. Female labor force, we talked about it, SMEs is all about, there's a complete missing middle in the MENA region, which means that you have lots of um, informal small companies under 10 uh, uh, employees and 10% of it which are big companies uh, who employ which employ a lot of people but you have a missing middle and if you know that two-thirds of the employment in the OECD countries is created by SMEs you can see the extent of the problem there it's perfect because I actually don't really have time to get into the World Bank group strategy um, so um, maybe just leave you with a few uh, um, with this slide, which is, um, which is new. Um, this slide is about uh, revising the strategy uh, along two kind of pillars. The first one is how to address the underlying causes of conflict and violence, how to work in the fields of social and economic inclusion to uh, reduce instability and hopefully to reduce conflict, very well documented um, at, at the World Bank, but also how to mitigate urgent consequences of conflict and violence. And that means working you know, hand in hand with organizations like the United Nations to have the humanitarian and the development um, pillars uh, work, work, work closely together. This is what is needed in Syria today and this is what um, we are trying to do collectively. The four pillars of the World Bank's new strategy are renewing the social contract, i.e. the trust between the citizens and the state that we're trying to create. Regional cooperation, of course, and there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, one that directly speaks to um, the refugees, and that's um, creating concrete projects in jobs, in education, to respond um, to it. And that will be our work in terms of implementation as of tomorrow, hopefully, the reconstruction and the recovery. So we do lead, you know, DNAs, it's called uh, damage needs assessment, in conflict in these countries these days, but we have um, a lot more. Um, a closing statement is basically to tell you that um, in order to go from the strategy to the implementation of the strategy, which should be our focus at the bank or elsewhere, because you know, as non-academics, we actually have a responsibility now to, to implement it. We don't have a responsibility to come up with good ideas, but we actually do have a bit of a responsibility to come up with the funding uh, for these good ideas. So guys, come up with the good ideas, we'll try to come up with the funding. The bad news, frankly, is for now, we haven't really come up with the funding yet, but we're working on it. So uh, to give you a, and, uh, and, and ask you to, to raise awareness around you, we're working with the G7 and the GCC countries on two different facilities, one on concessional financing, the other one on the guarantee facility. Hopefully that will crowd in resources, resources that we will need for the reconstruction of Syria. It's a bit early today, um, March 3rd, 2016, to talk about the reconstruction of Syria, but let us hope that, uh, thanks to Omar and the opportunity to talk about the causes and the consequences of the Syrian conflict, um, that it will bring us a bit closer to the end of that terrible conflict and to the implementation of the day action. Thank you very much. Hello. Okay. Thanks, Omar, for inviting me. Uh, let's take closes. It's okay. Uh, I'm
I'm really happy to be here. I was uh, originally going to talk about something else. In other words, I was going to reflect on what it's meant to report on this conflict. I have the very bad uh, problem with my editor that every time I want to get a beat that's relaxing and comfortable, they decide to send me somewhere where you know there's essentially either war or some interminable conflict. So my early experience was uh, in Peru in the early 1990s, uh, covering you know things like Sendero Luminoso and that delightful period of Peruvian history. And I seem to be in a rut, uh, looking for you know the lifestyle page or maybe the art section or something just a little less tense. Although, of course, if you don't cover conflict, uh, what's the point of the rest of the paper? And we've seen now, not merely Syria, but we've seen five Arab countries destroyed before our eyes. There was Iraq, of course, destroyed right through the 90s, and then again in 2003, calamitously. Libya, a country I first went to in 1974, destroyed, utterly, irredeemably. Hard to imagine how to put Libya together again. There is Yemen, which has been bombed since March 26th of last year. And very rarely a word about a country where more than half the population is near famine conditions. As Saudi Arabia continues its unchecked war on that country, the richest Arab country is bombing out of fury the poorest Arab country. That's the third Arab country destroyed before our eyes. Syria, wrecked. A country whose name used to mean dignity. Regardless of the details of you know, questions of prisons, brutal dictatorship, political suffocation. That's all true, but it stood for something. It stood for something in the same way that Algeria perhaps stood for something. A country that said to the world, we are going to make something happen. That's the brand, to use today's language, of Syria. Now Syria is essentially refugees and destruction. A country destroyed before our very eyes. Egypt, of course not the same kind of destruction, but a country also systematically being destroyed, at least its politics being eroded, again, completely with impunity. That is, the world powers have given the current leader of Egypt license to destroy that country. And then the sixth Arab country, which has been destroyed for over 60 years, and that's Palestine, which has not even been able to breathe in the modern period. This is the Middle East. This is what we are seeing in front of us. Why is this happening? In 15 minutes, I can't answer that question, but I can do something. Tomorrow, I'm going to Washington, D.C. because Code Pink has a summit on Saudi Arabia. It's about time people in the United States started to ask the question of what is this thing called Saudi Arabia and what is this thing called Saudi Arabia's relationship to its neighbors and what kind of chaos has it sown in the region. So I would like to spend my remaining 12 minutes talking about this thing called Saudi Arabia. You know, it's interesting, the United States under George Bush went to war in two countries, Afghanistan and Iraq, under whatever pretenses. But in both cases, Americans fought this war and the Iranians won. Because until 2003, Iran had been engaged by two historical adversaries. On the one side, the Taliban regime, and before that, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, which had a great visceral hatred of the Iranians. Secondly, on the other side, Saddam Hussein's Iraq, which had fought a Pyrrhic war against Iran between 1980 and 1988, and was the other wall to engage Iranian ambitions in the region. George W. Bush decided it was a great idea to go and break the walls around Iran and necessarily, therefore, opened Iran for the first time since 1979 to flex its regional ambitions and to open itself up all the way to the Mediterranean 
In fact, when the Arab Spring broke out, I remember in Cairo, Iranian officials would talk and say, this is not an Arab Spring, it's an Islamic Spring, which began not in Tunisia, but in Tehran in 1978-79. This is the phase of the Islamic Spring that is now uh, visible across the Arab world. You'll remember that everybody was jockeying to claim the Arab Spring. Erdogan went to Cairo as well and said, no, this is, you know, the Turkish Spring. And we want the Muslim Brotherhood to win across North Africa and they should replicate what the AKP has done in Turkey, God forbid. But anyway, they were all claiming this uprising. The United States, Israel and Saudi Arabia went apocalyptic after 2003 and repeatedly attempted to re-engage Iran. There were many strategies for this. The first, of course, began before 2003, but in 2002, when the Syria Accountability Acts started to emerge in the US Congress. And in the Syria Accountability Act, if you read particularly the 2005 version, they are quite explicit that what the United States government wants to do is to push Iran out of the region to break its connection with Syria, to stop Iranian resupplying of Hezbollah, which threatened Israel. So the Syria Accountability Act at no point was about the Syrian people. It was always about engaging Iran. Linked to that is a terrific WikiLeaks cable. Now, it's not a WikiLeaks cable, sorry. It's a State Department cable revealed by WikiLeaks by political counselor Robach from the Damascus U.S. Embassy, Damascus-based U.S. Embassy, who writes in this cable saying, United States needs to join the Egyptians and the Saudis in stoking fears among the Sunni population against Shiite domination in Syria. In other words, the United States would join with Mubarak's Egypt and with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to encourage sectarianism inside Syria. So the game here was not again about defending the Syrian people. It was always about breaking Iran's connection with the region. And I'm taking an agnostic position here, whether it's a good idea for Iran to have ambitions greater than the territorial borders of Iran or not. You know, that's a separate issue. Now, the second attempt to break Iran's, you know, uh, uh, influence in the region was Israel's war against Lebanon in 2006, which was a massive bombardment uh, of the Lebanese countryside and, of course, of Beirut, particularly the southern suburbs of Beirut. That was the second major attempt to smash uh, Iranian influence in the region. Neither did the Syria Accountability Acts initially work, nor did um, the bombing of Lebanon work very effectively at all. Just as when Israel withdrew from Lebanon in the year 2000, Hassan Nasrallah and Hezbollah was able to put itself forward, put themselves forward as the great Arab champions against Zionism after the 2006 bombing of Lebanon. It, in a sense, backfired uh, against Israel, Saudi Arabia, and American interests. The third attempt to engage Iran was, of course, the nuclear sanctions uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, drive, which united the Europeans, the UN, and the US government. Now, I, I can go on at great length about the UN sanctions on Iran. There's a level of absurdity here and hypocrisy that is unbelievable. Because, you know, the country I'm from, India, is a scoff law, is not a member of the International Atomic Energy Agency, has illegal nuclear weapons, and yet signed a nuclear agreement with the United States in 2005 for delivery. So the United States would help India, an illegal nuclear power, weapons power, get uh, nuclear fuel through the nuclear suppliers group at the same time as the United States urged India to vote against Iran to forbid Iran, which is a member of the International Atomic Energy Agency and has followed IAEA protocols and is treated as a criminal. I mean, the whole thing is bizarre. You know, if you travel outside the United States and talk to, you know, diplomats from other countries, they cannot understand how people in the United States don't see the blatant ridiculousness of some of the politics that emerge here. Now, of course, with President Trump, the blatant <laughs> obviousness might be settling in to people's minds. 
But really, this is not about Trump being a buffoon. The entire politics uh, of the United States in the region has a level of buffoonery that I think is very hard to uh, understand. And you know, you can't understand it by thinking of it as rational, because you'll go crazy rationalizing an irrational uh, policy. But the nuclear uh, sanctions regime didn't actually work because, again, here India and China continued to trade with Iran. If you travel to Tehran, you'll find in the center of Tehran, there are Chinese signs everywhere. Because Chinese construction companies, right through the sanctions period, have been building inside Iran. India was buying Iranian oil right through the sanctions period and paying for Iranian oil in Indian rupees in Indian banks. You know, uh, <laughs> this is something that you need to understand, that these countries simply didn't honor the sanctions agreement. They really didn't care. And there was no way to uh, go after them. There was no way to pressure them. The uprising in Syria, of course, provided uh, the third or fourth uh, mechanism when, you know, it is true, of course, that the uprising has many, many authors. Uh, it has many beginnings. But it also has a beginning that links it uh, to what the Syrian uh, Center for uh, Policy and Research calls the subjugating powers, which includes the regional powers. And Saudi Arabia plays an interesting role here. I don't have time. I don't want to spend too much time in this. But I just want to suggest that this percolating anti-Iranian feeling uh, plays a very large role in the politics that surround uh, what Patrick Searle in 1965 called uh, Syria being the mirror of rival interests. You know, the rival interests here are interests that are outside Syria, not merely inside it. Uh, Syria has always for a long time been a major prize in the region. Now, I don't have, I have five minutes to go. I have about 20 minutes more of stuff I want to say because I do want to come to where Omar uh, challenged us to think about ways out of this. So because of what I've set up, which is this, uh, you know, this attempt by Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the United States to engage Iran again, there are some actually fairly positive signs uh, on the horizon. I'm less bleak about the near future. Of course, I, I think there's no way uh, to be positive given the scale of devastation, not only of Syria, but Yemen, of, of Libya, etc. There's no way to be positive. But on the politics of it, there are at least two positive indicators. One, like Samir, I agree that the Russian intervention has utterly changed the situation. And in many respects, uh, it has created a sense of reality inside the Saudi royal family. Now, there's a problem there because King Salman and his particular coterie have put all their eggs into two baskets where they think they must win at least in one of them. One, of course, was in Syria, and the other is in Yemen. In Yemen, Salman's son, Mohammed bin Salman, personally is supervising that war. He has staked his personal legitimacy on winning the war in Yemen. So unless there's a good outcome in Yemen or in Syria, they felt they would have a hard time establishing their legitimacy as the rulers of Saudi Arabia. Because remember, Saudi Arabia, despite all uh, beliefs in the American media, is not a democracy. Uh, it's a royal uh, regime uh, with no democratic position. In fact, most of the population have no rights and are occupied just as Israel occupies the Palestinians. You know, it just happens that they come from South Asia, the Philippines, etc. But they have effectively no zero rights. So that's the nature of the regime. So the fact that the, there's a personal stake in winning these wars is very important. So is there a climb down for the king and his son? It looks like there might be. And one of them is uh, that, I'll come to that one. But before I say that, the Russian intervention has certainly sobered the Saudis so that when the Saudi king and his son uh, put out the view that Saudi Arabia is going to, perhaps with Turkey, invade Syria, send in a ground force in Syria, and boy, the bizarreness of this, I mean, you can't win a war in Yemen which is the poorest country, what troops are you going to find to go fight in Syria? I mean, the Pakistanis in their parliament voted against sending troops to uh, help the, the, the Saudis in Yemen. Who's going to send troops? You know, there's not enough Colombian mercenaries to go and fight in Syria as they have been fighting under Saudi flag in Yemen. You know, not enough Moroccans uh, fighting, uh, you know, that are going to come and join a Saudi intervention in Syria. So, they lashed out first and said, well, we'll invade. 
But then sober reality, when the generals inside the Saudi military said, I don't think we should invade. And that's when Saudi Arabia said, well, for now, we will not invade. The second interesting indicator of a shift takes place around what Olivier was talking about, which is the oil prices. Last week in Doha and Qatar, uh, four countries met. They were brought there actually by the Emir of Qatar. And that is a very interesting set of countries. Russia, which is not an OPEC member, Venezuela, crucial OPEC member, um, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. Four countries met in Doha, and they had an agreement to freeze oil production at current levels. This is a very important thing. Now, of course, oil analysts immediately jumped all over this and said, this is not going to make a difference. Because anyway, pumping levels are too high. Oil prices will remain you know, far uh, below uh, the spot uh, price that they need for their budgets. Nonetheless, it's a major thing if you look at it politically that these countries were willing to come to the table and that the Saudi oil minister al uh, said that it's important for us to create some basis for an understanding because Saudi Arabia's economy is suffering immensely. I don't have time to get into that. It's suffering immensely. So if you look uh, for the glimmers of space where Saudi Arabia itself is experiencing the contradictions of its policies in Syria, in the oil war that it's been fighting against Iran, against Russia, against Venezuela, etc. There has been a cessation of hostilities in all these venues. And I see this as a very important political opening. The problem, of course, is that inside Saudi Arabia, given that they staked their personal legitimacy on the war, the come down is going to be very, very complicated. And the Yemenis are certainly not going to sacrifice themselves for the dignity of Saudi Arabia so that the, the kingdom doesn't then lash out at another country. They have been fighting very hard, uh, you know, sustaining great losses, uh, watching their country being destroyed, and watching the United States, Britain, and other powers resupply Saudi Arabia during this battle. I just want to have you know that human rights agencies have said that every war crime Saudi Arabia commits in Yemen, the United States is complicit with because it has knowingly resupplied Saudi Arabia with the weaponry it's been using to attack hospitals and such like. Let me wrap this up. Here's what I would like you to think about. It's important to think about the scale of the carnage. It's important to think about the suffering. But it's equally important to recall, to think hard about the way in which American foreign policy structures you know, issues around the world, pushes and drives regional powers into conflicts that end up destroying you know, generations of people's lives. You have enough evidence of this in Central America and Latin America, so-called empires workshop. The Middle East is a perfect place if you want a laboratory for how an imperial force can destroy five, six countries with impunity, complete, without any accountability and get away. It's a perfect place to look at this. Get caught up in the details. Listen to people's story of suffering. Find out how you can get involved in terms of the refugee crisis. But don't forget the politics of this because it's bigger than us. It looks like something we can't shape and change. But if you don't tackle it at that end, this will reproduce, if not in, the, if not in this region, now somewhere else, perhaps again in Central Africa. Thanks a lot. so much for all our speakers. Uh, just as a reminder, we have a second panel coming up uh, in a, about 10-15 minutes. So please uh, stay for more important and uh, exciting talks about, uh, I don't know if exciting is a good word, but uh, informative uh, talks about the Middle East. But before we get to the second panel, I'd like to open up the space for some questions uh, for our speakers. Uh, there's a microphone that's going to be going around because we're uh, taping this, so if you could please raise your hand if you have a question or comment, and we'll come around to you. Okay. Right here. Thank you. Oh, uh, whoops. 
Um, my name is Karen Pfeiffer, and I, I'm a emeritus professor at Smith College. I have a question for uh, Olivier Lavinal. Uh, the World Bank um, seems to me we should have known prior to the uprisings that the kind of growth that was going on over the previous 20 years had not been inclusive, and there are a lot of signs of that, and, uh, and I was following it relatively closely, so I know there was evidence. Uh, but the program that, um, that the World Bank and the IMF and other agencies pursued, the stabilization, liberalization, privatization, uh, these programs uh, contributed, in my opinion, to that lack of inclusion. And um, the, I would like to know how the programs that you are proposing now would be different. When you talk about fiscal stability, for example, how is that different from the stabilization um, that you promoted before? And when you talk about the, uh, the development of SMEs as a solution, how is that different from liberalization and privatization that came before? So thank you. We'll take a few questions uh, and then we'll answer them. Yes. This question is directed at uh, the other three panelists, um, uh, but particularly the two who are themselves from the Middle East. Um, I will freely admit that I'm an American, so my question, no, no, so my question is, why is it my business to have any opinion on what happens in the Middle East? Because I don't live there, and from my experience, the only thing that Americans know how to do to help the Middle East is bomb people. So why should I have any opinion? Why should I be thinking, okay, I'm going to go home tonight. What can I do? What can we do? What is the right solution? How do we get out of this? Am I right in thinking that I have no business thinking about any of that? Um, my question is for Mr. Lavino from the World Bank. Um, I was wondering if you have any, um, if your plans include uh, addressing uh, issues of like commodities trading, uh, particularly, uh, I guess one of the factors that led to the Arab Spring was a rapid increase in the price of food. Um, and I imagine uh, lowering Right, st stabilizing commodities prices uh, pr is essential to like making sure everyone can get food, uh, and I don't know. That's a important stable. Um, I'm sorry, I'm totally losing track. It's a great question. Um, but yeah, I mean, do you have plans to address that? Because it seems like another crisis could easily reemerge um, if commodities prices can't be stabilized. Uh, One more question. Hey, uh, my question uh, directed towards uh, Mr. Prashad. Uh, and this is about uh, the, the peace talks in Geneva. And uh, I remember when Al Jazeera was doing the sort of live reporting there with the, uh, the Kurdish spokesman, uh, Salim Muslim, and before it was sort of stalled. Uh, he was never uh, granted any invitation to speak, and I sort of want to just uh, touch upon the peace talks and see if you can elaborate uh, on how that process uh, influenced the Syrian conflict, and more specifically, uh, what's the, the current situation going to be in light of this uh, neglection? in 
injustice in the U.S. that enough for any American to be just involved with, right? So that part I agree with. In perfect world, where the U.S. did not have any foreign politics to like destroy other part of the world, I will say why an American should be involved in foreign policy of the or, or like in crisis like the Syrian crisis. But the United States, with regional power and local power, like a lot of Syrian destroyed Syria, right? Not like it's not just foreign conspiracy against the country. But we did not know, like we, we cannot imagine what the destiny of countries like Syria and Iraq would be if they, the U.S. did not involve in the region for the last 40 years or moreover. The rise of ISIS maybe will not be an issue now if the U.S. did not destroy the Iraq army during uh, American invasion, right? So it's too late for Americans and for the, for the U.S. to be not involved in Middle East because the U.S., it's not the only power, but it's, it, it is one of the main powers that uh, contribute to the destruction of a lot of countries in the Middle East for the last decades. So that's my answer. Hopefully it will help you. And I can imagine that you are interested in foreign policy and in conflict in the Middle East to be here, so. <laughs> I don't know if this is. I don't know if this is going to please you or to panic you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thanks to your question, I felt back home in France uh, at the kitchen table on Sundays when you know my mother and my father asked me, you know, but what are you doing in the World Bank? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I come from a socialist family. What are you doing in the World Bank? <laughs> uh, uh, selling structural adjustment plans and, uh, and, uh, and making those poor countries even poorer. I just want to smile because uh, um, I haven't come up with a great answer, I have to say, just yet. But um, I do tell them this. I tell them that, you know, the World Bank hasn't cha has changed a lot since 1913. <laughs> and uh, that you are doing your best to actually continue in that, in that vein. Um, no, seriously, you know, in the 70s and the 80s and in the 90s uh, with the transition to uh, in, in Eastern Europe, we have drawn a certain number of lessons from it and from, from, from these transitions, good and bad lessons on, you know, the world, the, the role the World Bank or other international organiza organizations should play. Uh, one lesson is, of course, that we should um, always listen to countries and try to accompany them as much as possible and not come with clear-cut solutions. Um, which, you know, uh, tend to favor, as you said, fiscal stabilization or the private sector. One other lesson is that, you know, development takes time. And um, for um, these, uh, for, for the economy to, uh, to, 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 to be boosted, we need to, um, to um, ha work with governments again on reforms which make sense and which are inclusive. So it's true, we have been speaking uh, for a while about inclusive growth. The question is, have we been applying what we've been speaking about? And that's a fair question. Um, the, there is no, again, easy answer to it. What we noted with the Arab Spring is um, that we needed to prioritize differently. And I think that development is a question of prioritization. That's probably the answer to your question. You know, there is a number of um, sectors that we work in. There are a number of actions and policies that we uh, promote. Um, the question is when and why and how important these policies are. So <coughs> what's shifting these days, I would argue in the world, but especially in the MENA region, is that we are taking the focus that was so far on the private sector-led growth and we're putting a focus on social inclusion because we believe that in the face of conflict and adversity, it is probably more important to have serious policies on social inclusion, and it's probably more um, long-term development, if you will, than um, to start by the end, the end in this case being or boosting the private sector. Why do we boost the private sector? For the reason that I mentioned you know, earlier. We, tr we, we just um, take the figures out there and see that you know, in the OECD countries, most of the employment comes from SMEs. And if you want to unlock you know, the potential of, for, for jobs in these countries, one of the reasons or one of the solutions we believe is 
to create, as we say in the band, sorry for the lingo here, but to create a level playing field. That means very simply that, you know, if you want to build a company and a, you're a young Moroccan entrepreneur in Morocco, you should be able to. Um, you should be able to without having to have connections, what they call in the Arab world the wasa, um, without being um, uh, captured in any way, w uh, with being or with being able to actually access finance. So all of these things I think you would share and all of us share because we know from the field and from those people who are trying to you know, make a difference in the field that there are rules and regulations that we should be working on and pushing in order for these people to actually create um, uh, wealth and, 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 and hopefully share it. Um, you know the two questions were actually very much related, sir, because um, I was almost going to say that your question on commodity prices is um, an illustration of what the World Bank is trying to do differently. We advocate for fuel subsidies reform, right? We, we, we say, you know, it will um, free some space, some fiscal space, as we say, if, you know, you, you, you conduct fuel subsidy reform because it's sometimes five, six, seven percent of GDP which are spent on, on fuel subsidies. But what we've learned is that we cannot do this right off the bat. You know, we cannot advocate for it to happen from one day to the other because it creates or increases tension, be it fuel subsidies or fuel subsidies. If you stop them from one day to the other, you create tension. So what we're trying to do, going back to the prioritization question, is to actually um, ask or work with the countries to, in parallel, you know, roll out um, um, cash transfers, in parallel improve the social safety nets. Because one thing without the other, and you have either a bad reform or bad policies or actually a dangerous one. Uh, look at what happened in Yemen. Um, so there are risks um, there. Maybe just one, one final comment uh, that um, um, made me think uh, uh, of what Prime Minister El Abadi of Iraq said. You were speaking, ma'am, of stabilization. So we go into his office, Prime Minister El Abadi, and um, first thing he tells us is that we should work with him on stabilization programs. And we're kind of looking at each other, wondering if he has just swallowed the, the, the Economics 101 book or if we have you know, changed world and if everyone has... has, has, has uh, um, uh, converted to the World Bank or IMF, um, um, you know, um, theories. No, what he meant by that stabilization was actually economic and political stabilization. So he was actually talking about, um, you know, ensuring through social and economic inclusion, you know, in, and but I'm insisting economic meaning also fiscal, um, you know, stability, um, better prospect for peace and and and, and stability. And at the end of the day, once he said that, we knew that we could help him on the social front, and we should help him on the social front. We knew that we should help him on the economic front. And in order to help him, we were going to try, at least, to be part of the solution to a big problem he had. And that problem was, as soon as he went to the markets, he would borrow at 7, 8, 9, 10, 11%. And that kills a country, because if you borrow at these, at these rates, you know, you basically have to crush or crunch your investment, fu uh, uh, your investment funding and all what goes with it. So we're just trying to, you know, um, come up with uh, not nearly perfect solutions, but probably listen to the needs of the countries a bit more, um, sh stay away from these programs of the 80s and the 90s, which, you know, have proven only useful to a certain extent and quite disastrous to another extent and be a bit more pragmatic uh, in our way to uh, do development. Uh, I, I would just like to say that I think that uh, speculation in edible commodities should be banned. Uh -huh. But that's a political fight. That's not something that, for instance, the World Bank can deal with. You know, I mean, what Olivia just said about international borrowing comes to the heart of the problem. That's the other political fight, that money being lent to so-called underdeveloped countries is too expensive. And how to get international finance to provide cheaper money to countries that are in problems, you know, 
that need capacity, capital capacity so that then you can have banks internally that lend to people for private uh, businesses, SMEs, whatever. You have two political problems. One is that right now finance likes to feast on all kinds of markets including edible commodities markets and finance has decreed that uh, countries with good balance of payment record can borrow cheaper than countries that are in trouble. It seems totally counterintuitive. You know, why is it that money is cheaper for a rich country than a poor country? But that's a political question. That's not actually merely a technical problem. That you have to build, you have to fight to build political power in your world so that, you know, you can force the North uh, to reconsider the way politics is structured to create poverty around the world. You know, that's a separate matter. Just to come to your Geneva question, you know, in December, the Saudis invited their various proxies and others, not only their proxies, including the Turkish uh, groups, uh, Istanbul-based opposition, to Saudi Arabia, where they created the High Negotiating Council, you know, and that was to be the unified group that would pursue any Geneva round that came in this year. It's very interesting because, uh, again, just to borrow from Samir's uh, assessment, which I think is extremely correct, that the Russian intervention made it in impossible for these groups to come to Geneva with any power. Essentially, they were being asked to come to Geneva to surrender, which is why they refused to come initially and took a very long time before they came for a constrained discussion, not a full discussion. Secondly, the Turkish government, having seen that its objectives, which is the overthrowing of its former ally Bashar al-Assad, has failed, uh, has, as you know, kind of imploded in its war against its own Kurdish population and against the PYD. You know, and of course the YPG, the fighters, the PKK, etc., but also the PYD. And so the Turkish government didn't want the PYD, that is the Syrian Kurdish leadership, to be at the table. You, you'll, you'll see that in December, just as the High Negotiating Council met in Saudi Arabia, the PYD opened an office in Moscow. You know, what I'm just trying to suggest to you is that we've moved in the last 10 to 15 years from a unipolar world, where the United States was able to, since at least the fall of the Soviet Union, dictate terms. We've moved to a beginning of a multipolar world. The PYD doesn't really have any office in America. It has an office in Moscow. So this is the reason why the Syria process is going to be complex. And this is the reason also why I'm slightly optimistic. Because the United States and Russia have come to an understanding that there is perhaps a common narrative emerging at that level. Now the percolation down is going to be complicated because the Turkish government is caught, it's caught in a web of contradictions that it cannot seem to resolve. And so too the Saudis. So at the very highest level of politics, there is a kind of new narrative emerging. At the next level, it's not stabilized at all. Our second panel is titled, Rethinking Violence and Migration in the Middle East. And our uh, three speakers are going to be Professors Hiba Bwaka, Michael Clare, and Leila Kiyo. Uh, I won't read their bios because they're, they're in the program, but uh, I'll read the titles of their, uh, of their talks. Uh, Hiba's going to go first. Her talk is titled, Planning for the War Yet to Come. different scale. We're going to go down like down to a neighborhood level and it's going to it's going to uh, be uh, more about it's a very dystopic talk. Uh, it doesn't have like the hyper thing of like reconstruction and stuff, but we can have a discussion about it after. So Good evening. Thank you Omar for having uh, me part of this conference and as you see my talk today is entitled planning for the war yet to come. One day in 
Beirut, while I was listening to a popular Lebanese radio show discussing the challenges currently facing the city, the show's host at some point said, and I quote, I think we should all start thinking about urban planning. Look around you. In this city, planning lacks planning and order. This was not the first time that I heard such a statement. During my field work, I would often get the same reaction. You went all the way to the United States and came back here to study urban planning in Beirut? Does planning even exist in the city? For my interlocutors, after experiencing a 15-year civil war, planning promised a better future of well-being. However, many years later, in a region rocked with violence and millions of refugees, for them, planning has yet to deliver on that promise while the war is never too far away. In my work, I examine the underlying logics that make the fra phrase planning lacks planning and order a common sentiment in the city. I, do, I show that such a feeling develops when the specters of wars are always present, state structures are not clear, and public planning is often outsourced. However, I argue that such conditions are neither exceptional nor restricted to the paradigm of cities in conflict, like Beirut, Belfast, or Medellin. Assuming these cities are exceptional reproduces the same assumptions that this work seeks to destabilize, these assumptions are mostly rooted on how we think of the temporalities of planning and development. So how do we think of the future? Indeed, for so long, the field has been configured, uh, whether it's planning or development or reconstruction, has been configured within an imagined future of progress. However, today, we are at a global moment in which the imagined future in most places in the world, whether we're talking about the global south or the global north, is one of conflict, war, and contestation, or climate change, right? A horizon of what I call the war yet to come. Therefore, a study of the practice of urban planning, which is my field, and which usually is the, something that assumed to come after war, like you use urban planning to reconstruct, etc. So therefore, a study of the practice of urban planning in a city in conflict or post-conflict like Beirut could help us do the following. First, understand how cities and their futures are configured and uh, contested. Second, interrogate the role of something like planning or development and its actors. And then to use this knowledge to imagine, research, teach, and practice a different kind of politics and ethics of space making. In short, reimagining the future of planning in these cities. To explain, I will use one of my research cases in Beirut's peripheries, and I will go over it very, very briefly. But it helps illustrate the point. Beirut's peripheries tell a much, di much different stories about planning than the story commonly told about post-war reconstruction of Beirut's downtown after the end of the Civil War in 1990. So downtown's uh, uh, Beirut's reconstruction project, if you know anything about it, projected a future of sectarian reconciliation and peace, uh, like the things promoted by the World Bank, etc., through planning. You know? <laughs> <In contrast. laughs> In contrast, Beirut's peripheries, which are, <laughs> which are marginal yet formal spaces, suddenly emerged in 2008 to be frontiers of re renewed sectarian conflict. Planning practice plays a key role in the transformation of these mostly poor peripheries into sectarian frontiers. I argue that this transformation could be understood through the spatial and temporal logic of what I call the war yet to come, so the war yet to come does not treat war and peace as distinct categories by approaching war not as a temporal aberration in the flow of events with a beginning and an end. Rather, it focuses on how war, violence, and their anticipation have shaped Beirut's segregated geographies characterized by ongoing conflict and environmental crises. Temporally, the logic of the war yet to come refers to a present moment from which the future can only be imagined as that of contestation and war. And therefore, it provides a different lens than the yet to of modernization or post-war reconstruction, which assumes a predictable future that is used to manage territories towards progress. Beliefs that still guide much of the planning and development practice today. The future of the war yet to come instead is uncertain and volatile, and this affects how urban planning is practiced. And that's because planning as a tool is seen as a quintessential tool of managing urban futures. It emerged in places like Beirut and other cities in conflict as a terrain of contestation itself. So take, for example, Sahar Shweifet, a southeast periphery of, of Beirut. Although the area looks haphazard, it was 
actually planned. However, between 1996 and 2008, the master plan and zoning of Sahra Shwayfet changed eight times in 12 years. The area is located next to, Be to the international, Beirut International Airport and adjacent to Dahi, southern, suburb, southern suburbs of Beirut, or commonly known as like Hezbollah stronghold in the, in the city. During the Civil War, this er the area was an agricultural land heavily guarded by its Druze landowners. If, for those of you who don't know, Druze, uh, Druze are a minority religious group in the Middle East. The, the two main actors that I will talk about here are the Shia Hezbollah and the Druze-affiliated Progressive Socialist Party, uh, the PSP. After the end of the Civil War, with pressure of urbanization from Adahi, massive low-cost housing projects started mushrooming in the area. Most of the incoming residents were war-displaced families who were living in makeshift shelters in Civil War ruins for 20 years. So basically, you can see here the newer hollow um, concrete blocks. These were like the houses that they uh, created inside the destroyed buildings and lived in them for 20 years. They were mostly Hezbollah affiliates. The real estate developers were also Hezbollah <coughs> affiliates who were financially supported to provide low-cost housing in the area. These massive developments did not go unnoticed by the PSP-affiliated municipality. In order to stop the urbanization of the area as a Shia territory, the PSP, through its different positions inside and outside the government, worked towards zoning the area as industrial. While at the same time, Hezbollah worked towards zoning it residential. As political alliances ebbed and flowed between the two groups, zoning, building laws, etc., kept changing. So here, industrial zone is a synonym for Druze territory, and residential zone is synonym for the Shia territory, as one planner told me. So you see here, the red is industrial, the blue and green are residential, and you see how it changed over time. And these are only four of the many iterations. So between the industrial and residential, Sahra Shwayfit is now a patchwork of apartment buildings in the vicinities of industries and an active urban agriculture area. Every winter, the area witnesses an environmental disaster when rainwater gets mixed with industrial waste and soil, fills the residential streets. This has, this you can see here, this has severely affected living conditions as well as agricultural output of the area. In 2008, as sectarian battles raged in the streets of Sahra Shwayfet and dozens were killed, another battle took place over another rezoning iteration. The PSP passed the master plan that reinscribes the area as middle income to slow its urbanization. So for example, you see here, the 2004 zoning plan regulations allowed for hollow concrete and use of corrugated or tin sheets, and this is basically in spatial terms, read low income, like you can use tin and corrugated sheets. However, you can see here in the 2008 zoning plan regulations, the facade should be cladded with 60% natural stone, 60% of the roof should be covered with red tiles, landscaping, uh, two apartments per floor, per block, limiting it. So you can see how this is a much more expensive kind of construction and actually increase the apartment uh, price by at least three times and thus uh, decreasing the affordability of the area. Military geographies are also key to these schemes since both actors function as paramilitaries with expected roles in local and regional wars yet to come. Therefore, parliamentary urban strategies like domination of hilltops and access to weapon tunnels through the airport are key to these planned geographies. For example, the contestation here over industrial and residential has also to do with the ability to connect to the airport. You see here. Also, PSP's rezoning of the hilltops as a villa area, as in V, aimed to stop the urbanization, on military, military, the, the urbanization of dense uh, Hezbollah housing on military strategic hills. So you see the change in the zoning here, and the decrease in the, um, in the uh, possibility to build. This rezoning is not only related to these actors positioning in local wars, but also regional ones. Sahra Shwayfet was bombed in the July 2006 war on Lebanon, and was targeted in 2014 by the first ISIS-affiliated suicide bomber in Beirut, inserting uh, Beirut's peripheries as a node in the Arab-Israeli conflict, as well as the Shia, Sunni Shia conflicts that are raging in the region. So what are the implications of this work to urban studies um, and cities in conflict and beyond? 
This study reconfigures the ways in which cities in the global south are often conceptualized as a binary between uh, the city center and their marginalized peripheries. Yeah. It illustrates how Beirut's peripheries are centers locally, so basically they shape the urbanization of the peripheries of the peripheries, and transnationally as embedded in circulations of militarization, <coughs> conflict, and finance. As a result, it's important to study not only centers of cities, but how peripheries of the global south are being planned and contested, especially in, in, in such contexts. Central to this center periphery configuration are the spatial practices of religious political organizations. This research shows how these actors are actually networks that constitute the state and outside it, thus challenging the established public, private, state, civil society, government insurgency binaries. And this is important because it actually makes us rethink what the state is. So rather than assuming a state is like some solid entity, to, to rethink that. In addition, they are not simply local bounded actors, but are also transnational. So common in the Middle East and beyond, understanding how such key urban actors function is actually critical to rethinking production of space, reconstruction, construction of infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. As we saw, these networks of actors play a significant role in the exercise of ordering the present through their expected roles in future, of, in, in, uh, in future wars. In Beirut's peripheries, what counts in their schemes, in addition to ruling the real estate and housing markets, are these military geographies that I just talked about. And so basically, it en ends up being a militarization of everyday life. So everything is kind of can be um, militarized. Uh, now that the window of an apartment is an everyday window that um, but also a sniper location in the event of future war, mm -hmm. the binary between housing, retail, infrastructure, and militarized spaces actually collapses. So we don't have a separate militarized spaces and everyday life. They're actually one and the same. And this could be seen reflected, for example, if you're interested in larger geopolitical issues, in rethinking military strategies um, in how the US military uh, rethought its training um, since their involvement in the Iraq, uh, in the Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan <coughs> war. So for example, they cons constructed what they call Arab towns, where they actually practice their uh, military training uh, in Nevada and California. Mm. Under, and they're very interesting, there are some videos on, on, online. They keep removing them, but they're interesting, check them out. <laughs> <laughs> Understanding the spatial practices of these actors, have become of paramount importance in the unfolding debates of the future of religious coexistence in the Middle East, especially at this historical moment of post-Arab uprisings, where many cities in the region, including Damascus, Cairo, Homs, Hama, to name just a few, are plighted with sectarian violence, destruction, mass displacement, and thousands upon thousands of refugees. Like we heard before, uh, there's at least 1.5 million refugees in Lebanon out of a four mil uh, in a four million uh, people country. So basically, this, it raises the question of what do we mean by coexistence. We tend to, um, to talk this word, like to just mention word religious coexistence, religious coexistence. However, such a research questions what does it mean to geographically talk about uh, coexistence? What are the boundaries of religious <coughs> coexistence? And this brings me to my point about planning, which is a key tool of arranging territories. <coughs> In terms of planning, I show that see these seemingly uh, unplanned geographies, like Sahra Shwaifet, are the results of layers upon layers of contested planning exercises over different imagined futures. And it is in such places planning has become actually a tool of conflict as much as that of peace and order. And we should take note of that rather than just assume that planning and development are like things that bring peace <coughs> and balance. So taking already made planning models and applying to contexts like Beirut is central to this problem. So my interviews with planning practitioners show that they are mostly trained in Eurocentric um, ideas and are having a crisis in imagining an effective role beyond what in Lebanon commonly called the pie-sharing logic of sectarianism. Right? I show how this is in part caused by the evacuation of development ideas uh, in, the, in, in their basic sense, not like as development big D like as human development, poverty alleviation, from planning in Beirut. Uh, as a result, planning has become a tool of delineating zones that delegate development within them to religious political organizations. And this is key because it shifts citizenship from being state-based to becoming sectarian-based, right? The outcomes are planned spaces that are low income, have overlapping uh, industrial and residential zones where highways are never finished, and playgrounds are never uh, uh, built. 
These are what I call the geographies of the war yet to come, which brings me to my last point on sectarianism. The geographies of the war yet to come illustrate how what is referred to as sectarianism is spatially and temporally produced. Such an ground ethnographic engagement shows how the production of sectarian difference is unstable, because it keeps changing, right? And contested, like the spaces <coughs> of conflict, domination, and profit it shapes in an image. Redefining, what it, uh, redefining in turn what sectarianism comes to mean at each historical moment. This shift in understanding sectarianism from being natural or portrayed by some media here in the US almost as a biological phenomenon to one that is socioeconomically, politically, and spatially produced. Um, this reshift in the understanding is very much needed for the future of cities in the Middle East, right? To think about it, how it's produced rather than assume it's like natural. It is within these articulations that we can understand how, for example, the Lebanese have debated a proposed law to ban land sales between Christians and Muslims for a period of 15 years within the stating aim of preserving religious coexistence. Such a law is the ultimate spatial manifestation of the war yet to come and aim to lock the city in the present for the future can be only imagined as bleak. Yet as shown, these territories of poverty and frontiers of sectarian conflict are constantly being negotiated and reconfigured, which is where one could locate hope in the otherwise dystopic geographies of the war yet to come. Thank you. stayed on. Um, so first, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, my group, the Peace and World Security Studies, is one of the sponsors of this, and I want to say I'm very um, honored to be able to do so. And so far, we haven't had an opportunity to um, honor uh, Omar Dahi for his work. It's really his work. And his work. Omar is a, a good colleague, and I've benefited from his uh, conversations over the past few years as Syria has sunk into disaster, and I've learned tremendously from him. And some of what I say is sort of reflections on our conversations. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to speak about the geopolitical uh, dimensions of the Syria conflict. Uh, some of what I say overlaps a bit with what Vijay said, but a somewhat different perspective, and I will uh, certainly look forward to how you um, respond to these different perspectives. So the conflict in Syria, as we know, is one of the greatest human tragedies of modern times, and we heard some of the tallies of those killed and wounded and driven from their homes, so I don't have to repeat that. The question is, what explains this catastrophe? Who's responsible? And this is a question that I think is going to live with us for a long time to come. It's not a, there's no simple answer to that, and I, I think it'll be a long time before we could answer that definitively. But I think a good part of the answer to this lies in the distinctive nature of the world system at this particular juncture in time. Now, political scientists try to explain world events by looking at what, what they call the nature of the international system. That is, the configuration of the major powers, their relationships with each other, and their relations, relationships with lesser powers in the system. And, and uh, by, by, by explaining that, you can try to explain what's happening in the world. So during the Cold War era, we had a bipolar world system with two superpowers, each acting as the center of a web of radiating alliances and client systems with 
various uh, hierarchies of partners, allies, and client states. When one of these outlying states rebelled or sought to join the other camp, the superpowers tended to intervene militarily to preserve their hegemony over their respective spheres of influence. And this led to periodic wars in Korea and Vietnam and Afghanistan, for example, but also ensured a certain degree of predictability and stability in this system. When the Cold War ended, many analysts believed we had entered a unipolar world with a sole superpower remaining and a number of secondary power centers, Europe, Japan, Russia, and India at a second level, not on the same level as the United States. Because none of these secondary centers of power was strong enough to challenge the USA, it was thought global order could be maintained by the US acting unilaterally or in conjunction with its allies and other, and, uh, other combinations of other power centers uh, to preserve its interests and world order. This led, this was thought, to be honest. this led to a kind of triumphalism in the United States, especially during the second Bush administration, a belief that the United States was so overwhelmingly powerful that it could intervene anywhere in the world with impunity. But this triumphalist outlook was demolished in Iraq in 2004 when it was discovered that America's supremacy and conventional military power um, so effective when confronting lesser conventional armies like Saddam Hussein's armies was ill-equipped to fight an unconventional force like the Sunni resistance in Iraq or the Taliban in Afghanistan. Though the U.S. has repeatedly inflicted devastating defeats on those forces, it has utterly failed to eradicate them and continues to suffer losses from those in other irregular, unconventional, asymmetrical forces around the world. As a consequence of the US defeats in Iraq and Afghanistan, the sole superpower mystique has evaporated. The US does remain in possession of the most powerful nuclear and conventional military forces in the world, and is the only country able to fight on many areas simultaneously but appears incapable of defeating unconventional adversaries or, because of domestic, economic, and political reasons, deploying large ground armies in contested areas of the world. Meanwhile, other centers of power, driven by their own ambitions and encouraged by a perception, perception of declining U.S. vigor, have sought bigger roles for themselves in the global system. The era of one big power center, the unipolar world, is over. And instead, we have a world of many contending power centers, a multicentric world, with the, each aspir aspiring power center seeking more power and influence at the expense of all the others. Of these aspiring, aspiring powers, two stand out because of their ambition to be let's call them near superpowers, that is Russia and China. I won't talk much about China. China, once great power that suffered enormous humiliation in the colonial period, now seeks to reclaim what it sees as its historic destiny as a major power in Asia. Russia, a once great power and former superpower that suffered great humiliation after the Cold War, now seeks to reclaim what it sees as its historic destiny as the dominant power in Eurasia. But these are not the only players seeking to enhance their power position in this new multicentric world. Turkey, a largely Sunni Muslim nation and the descendant of an empire, the Ottoman Empire, uh, it seeks to play a major role in the Islamic world. Iran, a largely Shiite Muslim nation and the descendant of another empire, the Persian Empire. Being the descendant of an empire, I think, is, is, is a pathology. <laughs> it doesn't go away. All these countries were once empires, including the Russian Empire and the Chinese Empire. 
And Iran seeks to extend its sway over the Middle East as well and to uh, protect Shiite regimes throughout the Middle East, as VJ noted. Saudi Arabia, a largely Sunni Muslim nation that is the world's number one oil producer, seeks to play a major role in the Islamic world and to contain the influence of its arch rival, Iran. Each of these countries is prepared to cooperate with others when it suits their interests, but all are most interested in advancing their own ambitions whenever and wherever possible. And this is the world, I believe, that has existed since the outbreak of the Arab Spring in 2011. When the Arab Spring erupted, the USA at first sought to align itself with the more progressive forces in Egypt and Tunisia, putting pressure on Hosni Mubarak to step down. But this earned the enmity of Saudi Arabia, which correctly feared the collapse of authoritarian regimes and monarchies throughout the region. And the Saudis have viewed the US with distrust ever since. Then came Libya. Concerned about the potential for a bloodbath carried out by the Qaddafi forces in eastern Libya, the US organized a NATO intervention with UN support to disrupt the Qaddafi forces. But what started as a humanitarian, supposedly, humanitarian mission with Security Council approval UN Security Council Re Resolution 1973, Russia and China abstained, but they did not prevent it. Evolved quickly into a drive to defeat and unseat Gaddafi. In other words, regime change. And while ousting Gaddafi seemed like a good idea at the time, no real preparations were made to ensure a peaceful democratic transition, transition and chaos, sectarian violence, and civil war ensued. As a result, two things. Russia vowed that it would never again allow the, the UN support for humanitarian intervention, believing that this would be a guise for regime change against its own allies. Number two, the Obama administration became leery of engaging in humanitarian intervention in any situation that could lead to another Li Libya, another protracted civil war. So this brings us to Syria. The only thing I believe, and I wonder what Omar thinks, the only thing that could have prevented the slaughter in <coughs> Syria, I believe, is a concerted effort by a majority of the key actors I've named, the US, Russia, Iran, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia, to force the Assad regime to meet with the opposition and negotiate a power, negotiate a power sharing arrangement. I can't read that. Thank you, of some sort. <laughs> this sort of thing that's happening now. But such an effort was impossible because Russia had historic ties to the Assad regime and was unwilling to go along with anything that might look like a repeat of Libya. Russia also saw this as an opportunity to regain its status as a major international power and to erode America's superpower sole superpower status. Iran, seeing a Shiite ally coming under attack, rallied behind Assad and provided him with arms, equipment, military expertise, and funds. Saudi Arabia, distrusting the US and seeing an Iranian-backed regime fighting a mostly Sunni opposition, provided crucial arms and financial aid to the opposition, as did other Persian Gulf states. Turkey, viewing Assad as a rival, also provided aid to the uh, opposition. And the US, fearful of another Libya-like disaster, was fearful of anything but the most limited involvement. As a result of all this, there was no international response, no effective international response to the disaster, but rather the opposite. The pouring in of more fuel on the fire, more arms, more equipment, more money to the various sides, allowing this prolonged um, violence to continue indefinitely. In my mind, it's this perverse international response driven by geopolitical competition among the major actors rather than any concern for the welfare of the Syrian population that 
accounts for the long longevity and destructiveness of the war. Lessons from this and where we go forward. In this world of multiple contending power centers, it's impossible, I think, it's I, I, what I take from this is it's impossible to achieve progress on critical challenges like Syria or Libya or Yemen unless you could get a majority of the key actors, including at least two of the three major, major powers, US, Russia, and China, plus some combination of the others on the same page. You have to have that in order to get a solution. I think we're beginning to see that happening now. And that's because, as, as, as we've heard, partly because of the Russian intervention, which has sort of eliminated the prospects for the, um, for, for the independent opposition to Assad. And secondly, because of the rise of ISIS, the Islamic State, because ISIS poses a threat to all of the other major actors, to Iran, Syria, I mean to Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Turkey, United States, are all threatened by ISIS. So it's possible to imagine an outcome in which all agree to some sort of transitional government in Syria that, and everybody then joins together to fight ISIS. Whether or not this will happen, I cannot say. But what I do believe is that from now on, success in international relations will require finding a formula that brings together a majority of these actors behind a shared goal, even if that goal is no, not any of them their prime objective, but something they could all get behind. And lacking such agreement among these major players, we will have more serious. So that's what I take from this um, experience. And I look forward to your feedback later. into Turkey. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my own research and how it connects to um, the situation of Syrians in Turkey. Louder? Okay, I can just move towards it too. Yeah. Yeah. Hello? Can you hear me better now? Okay. Um, as Turkish American and as an anthropologist of the Middle East who works in Turkey, when I heard that Syrian refugees in Turkey were being categorized as guests, it struck a particular chord. In Turkish society, as in the wider Middle East, being a good host is an important role and responsibility, and being a guest is an honor. The reasons for this are complex, and I won't get into that here, except to say that certainly simplistic Orientalist tropes regarding how ancestral Bedouin tribespeople, Turkish nomads, and Islamic pilgrimage were dependent on such reciprocity, these things don't fully explain the continued significance today of the status of guest and host. But what anyone intimately familiar with Turkey also knows is that despite the honored place of the guest, actually the best thing someone can say to you when you've entered their home is, um, Misafir Dilsen, you're not a guest. You're welcome here, you're, you belong. Um, make yourself at home. Um, the Turkish government and organizations trying to assist the over two million now Syrians in Turkey are realizing that Syrians are no longer guests. Whether they plan to go back to Syria eventually or not, many have already been in Turkey for five years, and at least 100,000 children have been born in Turkey. Um, in one survey I saw of Syrians, um, over two-thirds want to stay or will have to stay because of Europe and the West's refusal to take them in. The situation demands a transformation in Turkey from the current temporary protection regime that manages the emergency needs of refugees as guests to one that supports the inclusion of a new population into a newly acknowledged multicultural society. 
This shift has, not only, um, has only just begun to be discussed in Turkey and needs, certainly needs more work to fully succeed. As of now, Syrians have legal routes to housing, healthcare, education, and jobs. However, there are problems, many problems, of access with these, and they can't claim asylum in Turkey, um, and there's no route to citizenship either. Uh, I can speak to this shift and certainly others uh, as well, um, more in the question and answer period. Um, but right now I want to limit my remarks to a comparison of this, um, speak a little bit more about the Syrian case, but also compare it to research that I did with Moldovans in Turkey. <coughs> there are a lot of ways that categorizations of migrants affect the reception and the aid they receive in so-called host societies. In recent media coverage of the migration crisis in Europe, we see how the term migrants or illegal migrants are deployed as code for undocumented labor migrants. These individuals' mobility, their right to entry into Europe, is deemed illegitimate and criminalized. NATO, a military organization, is called out to stop them from crossing the Mediterranean, to repatriate them to their countries of origin or the port they departed from, and to catch the smugglers. Sometimes the very fact that a person is taking a certain route or that they're from a certain country is used to make assumptions about the type of migrant they are. For instance, a Syrian is presumed to be a refugee while a Pakistani might be presumed to be a labor migrant. But if one looks closely at the narratives of migrants themselves, as anthropologists do, we find time and again that the reasonings for migrating are very complex, combining economic, social, political, and existential rationales. A Syrian may be fleeing because war has ruined their business prospects, as well as because of the more general dislocation caused by the war. A Pakistani could be migrating because of a protracted ethnic conflict that has limited their ability to provide for their children. These complexities are not taken into account in many programs that target aid solely for specific types of victims of forced migration. Knowing that economic uh, dislocation is not deemed a legitimate reason for migration, many migrants are strategic in explaining their migration as a result of a threat that is recognized as legitimate in order for, to gain entry to their desired destination. One Turkish anthropologist found that Iranian refugees in Turkey, for instance, um, were converting to Christianity to increase their chances of asylum abroad. This situation puts into question the effectiveness of humanitarian efforts, but it also has prompted many anthropologists of migration and of policy to ask, what are such efforts really accomplishing, and what might be some of the unintended effects? Let me give you an example from my own research on the effects of counter-trafficking programs on Moldovan migrant women in Turkey, um, which is a chapter of my book just out this year. Um, <laughs> Uh, for this, I conducted 15 months of transnational research in Moldova and Turkey um, on um, Moldovan women coming from Eastern Europe in Moldova to work in Turkey as domestics for about 6 to 12 months at a time. Uh, the, this undocumented migrant labor has been undertaken voluntarily by these women and is viewed by them as an extension of the wage earning roles they held as former Soviet worker mothers. With the fall of the Soviet Union and the institution of neoliberal capitalism, Moldova became known as the poorest nation in Europe. As a result of this economic dislocation at home, a third of the population works abroad, including half of the working age population, and half of that population are women. Many are traveling to work in Turkey, where they make 10 times what they could make in Moldova if they did have a job there. Uh, I found that their remitted wages allows their families at home not only to survive, but to thrive. They send their kids to better schools, renovate their houses overall, and in increase their overall upward mobility. Um, that said, they also face many difficulties and exploitations in their travels and in their workplaces in Istanbul, and also outside their workplaces in, in Istanbul and in Turkey at large. In light of the situation, I took these women's narratives of exploitations to the IOM Moldova, the International Organization um, for Migration. This is the foremost institution dealing with migrant women in this region of Eastern Europe and Turkey. The staff sat eyes wide and mouths agape, and one exclaimed, there really is domestic work in Turkey? Most staffers believed that the idea that such work existed at all was a ruse used by traffickers to lure ignorant women from Moldova into sex work in Turkey. 
Certainly such sex trafficking cases do exist, and the IOM counter-trafficking team works hard to address them. Yet, the IOM admitted they're struggling to find victims of trafficking, and this has put their projects, their counter-trafficking projects, into <coughs> crisis. When they did research to address this crisis, it revealed, as many scholars have also revealed, that there's a diversity of women migrants. Many were not the poorest of the poor of their communities. Many were mothers who needed um, money for their families' needs, and many sought to work abroad voluntarily. And there were also a diversity of trafficking victims. Um, many were not women, and um, there were other kinds of trafficking situations besides um, for uh, sex trafficking other types of labor exploitations. Despite this new data, the IOM continued to focus their campaigns for women migrants on poor young single female victims of sex trafficking and on stopping women's migration from Moldova to Turkey, while not giving these Moldovan women any alternatives for work and upward mobility at home. Such projects thus collude with a conservative gender ideology that delegitimates women's labor and migration altogether an ideology that would keep women at home as nurturers to their families instead of acknowledging that they also make important economic contributions to their households and communities. There are other projects at the IOM that tar target labor migrants and labor migrations or labor exploitations associated with them, but those are targeted for routes primarily taken by men. Um, the ones for women are, are primarily the, in the counter-trafficking programs. So such campaigns put severe limits on our understanding of women migrants, their motivation and agency, the variety of exploitations they face, and the impact of their migration and labor. Moreover, they hamper our ability to address the needs of women and their families as they themselves articulate them. In ethnographies of migrant women, as I mentioned, we find that many women actually choose to work abroad in a variety of types of work, and they carefully weigh the costs and benefits, and their reasonings for migration are complex. Um, they're seeking not just survival, they're driven, but not by traffickers or even at times poverty, but for upward mobility for their, themselves and their families. They're ambitious and trying to forge a new way of being, in this case, a worker mother in a transnational and leo, neoliberal context. So among other things, this example illustrates how categorizing the routes migrants take and migrants themselves in particular ways as guests, refugees, labor migrants, or trafficking victims creates constraints on the aid for which they're eligible. In doing so, projects to help migrants also work to reproduce conventional ideas or construct new ones about who may legitimately seek geographic and upward mobility or claim a right to belong.